Hey, everyone, welcome to Left of Straight Podcast, season number seven. We got a new name, a new logo, same great interviews and same great podcasts for you five days a week. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm the host and producer, Scott Fullerton, and I always love sharing stories of our LGBTQ community and, of course, straight allies. Have a new lineup happening. It starts today. We're going to be doing Left of Straight Show interviews every Wednesday and Thursday. On Friday, we're bringing you back Standing on My Soapbox, where we'll be talking about hot button issues of the day. Uh, Mondays, we'll be doing Bears of a Certain Age with my good friend Johnny Sheffield out in Spokane, Washington. And Tuesday, it's always time for Little Five Questions with bringing back our guest from the previous week for five hot seat questions to have a little fun with him and get some fun answers. So I hope you'll tune in this season. We're starting off with a month of new sponsors here. I'm so excited to welcome them aboard. We have Explorer Cold Brew Coffee. If you like a little cold brew coffee, but you like to be able to pick your caffeine level, Explorer Cold Brew is the one for you. You can choose anywhere from no caffeine to extra high test caffeine for those nights out in the town. So be sure to check them out. We'll be having more from them throughout the first month and a half of the season here. Also, we have Fruit Loots gifting on. Our good friend David Cruz and his friend Alan has started an amazing company where you can go to their website at fruitloots.com and find gifts for just about anyone under the sun. You can either pick your own things to put in a great little goodie basket or they have some curated boxes that have to do with prides, birthdays, and so much more. I love having a little bit of easy gifting, and Fruit Loots makes it possible. And finally, Spencer Hoddison's Gay Water is coming on board for the first month and a half. If you haven't tried Gay Water yet, it's available at just about every state now. It's an amazing drink. You have four flavors to choose from. It's a, a gay guy's favorite, vodka and soda. So be sure to check it out for all my new sponsors. Show them a little love. Tell them the Left of Straight Show sent you. And we'll be talking about them throughout the month. But let's get on to the show, shall we? I'm so excited. Um, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you always being part of the Left of Straight family here. Um, we're kicking off season seven with two great interviews. If you're only seeing one here, be sure to check uh, the station for your other link. We're bringing Rob Madge all the way from good old UK, England. Uh, Rob is an amazing performer. They're one person show. My Son's a Queer, What Can You Do, is coming from the UK to Broadway this February. And then we have, from Broadway, the amazing Tom Dangora is with us. He's producing three amazing shows this season, uh, from Harmony by Barry Manilow, to How to Dance in Ohio, which I'm a fan of, of course, to Upcoming Suff. So uh, going to be a great season here, and we're kicking off season seven with Salute to Broadway. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Enjoy. <laughs> Welcome to the Left of Straight Show, where we talk entertainment, music, books, foodies, and more each week with special guest interviews of interest to the LGBTQ community and our straight allies. Your host, Scott Fullerton, chats with some of your favorite entertainers, celebrities, newsmakers, and behind-the-scenes people across the country and around the world who make it all happen. So sit back, grab your favorite beverage, and let's start talking. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Left of Straight Show Interviews Edition. I'm Scott Fullerton, your host as always, and I'm so honored to be one of the go-to podcast for everything LGBTQ and entertainment and beyond. Today, I'm thrilled to have a special guest joining us in studio. He's a luminary in the world of Broadway. Tom D'Angora is here. Tom is a multi-talented producer, director, writer, and activist. He's been a driving force behind some of the most talked about Broadway productions that are on stage right now and the near future, including Harmony, How to Dance in Ohio, and the groundbreaking suffs. I can't wait to talk to them all about this and more, but first, take a look. Oh, 
curse there was. guest has shined his name upon. Tom's contributions to theater and entertainment world have been marked by creativity, passion, and a commitment to telling stories that matter. I would list all of his amazing works he's been a part of, but I literally strained my scrolling finger going through them all, so look him up amongst yourselves, and welcome to Left of Strange Show for the very first time, Mr. Tom D'Angora. Tom, how the heck are you, sir? Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited you're taking the time to be here. You had a big Broadway opening again the other night, which we'll get into in a little bit. But you're you're on the move all the time, my friend. Yeah, well, you know, if you slow down, you rust. There you go. That's it. Exactly. Well, gosh, I'm so excited to have you here. I always like to start with people that have been on the show with two questions. The first is, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what kind of a kid were you growing up? Oh, um, I grew up in Massachusetts, um, Cape Cod. <laughs> um, I was a I was a very strange child. Um, I loved soap operas. I was obsessed with ABC Daytime. Obsessed, obsessed. Uh, yes. I I truly believed I was Dorian Lord as a child, and was even uh, one time thrown out of class in second grade because I would only answer to Dorian Lord. So, uh, but luckily my, uh, my mother backed me up and said to the principal, we all want to be Dorian. She's fabulous as she smoked her cigarette and drank her Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. I love that. Uh, Dorian, all the Vicky, all, all oh, their epic fights. Oh, the best. Loved all of that. So much fun. And my second question, I always talk about your out and proud, married to your husband, Michael. When did you first kind of come out to yourself? And where do you feel you kind of started finding your LGBTQ tribe? You know, I, I was very young. I, I, I never was in. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't. Um, so it just it, it just always, uh, even in the 80s when I was a kid, um, I marched in the first ever youth pride march in the history of the world in Massachusetts in the early 90s. Uh, from very young in high school, was part of, you know, uh, the Gay Straight Alliance. Um, the Cape Cod, Cape and Islands Youth Gay Alliance, it was called, Boston Glass. I did the, um, the, the retreats when I was a kid. Uh, so it was always a giant part of my life. My dad's gay and uh, I was very, very big in the AIDS movements in the 80s and 90s. So I marched in the AIDS walks with my father in the 80s. So it's just been always, um, hashtag nice. blessed. And did you kind of, did you start finding your tribe just through your attraction for being out there? Or when did you kind of feel like you really were part of the community? Yeah, well, I mean, I found my two best friends, my lifelong best friends, David and Jay, freshman year in high school. We just kind of found each other and have stayed friends the whole time and came out to each other in the high school because we went to an all-boys Catholic high school, <laughs> which is not as hot as it sounds at all. Not at all. <laughs> but um, And then when I started doing theater is really when it, when it started, when I started finding finding our people, and I lived so close to Provincetown, I spent so much time in Provincetown, and that is just 
a world changer and I spent half of my life there, you know, and that is yeah. our tribe. Of it's course. Home, it's home it base. Is. It's home base. It, is. it exactly is. I mean, it's our holy land. Uh, that's home base and mother world is San Francisco, West Hollywood and New York. And you're there. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Fantastic. I love hearing that. We're going to do a retrospective kind of this is your life on you, Tom. Let's start uh, with some of the early stuff and move on to these amazing products that are going on in Broadway right now and are to come. Let's start with some film work. I mean, you and I have a lot of parallels. I was looking over all your work. We've, we've worked with some of the same people and know a lot of the same people. I want to start with Mangus with the great Leslie Jordan. Oh. Uh, Coolidge. Talk about that project. What was that like being a producer on there? Did you spend much time on set? No, I really didn't. My dear friend who passed away, Ash Christian, uh, wrote, produced, and directed it. And he had uh, come up as a teenager for writing, producing, directing, and starring in a movie called Fat Girls, if you might remember it. It was a really big deal. And he was a high school senior when he did it. And we met, God, I think we met on Manhunt or something, honestly, but um, <laughs> or whatever it was back then. Um, and we just became really, really dear friends. And he was a genius. And um, I would follow him anywhere. So he he asked me to join that movie. And I read the script. And it was brilliant. And uh, my old friend, Heather Matarazzo, was in it. And we had spent a, a lot. Me and Heather had hung out a lot during the Princess Diaries days when she had just done that film. And Anne Hathaway was just a kind of star. So I got to hang out with her all summer. In uh, summer of, I think, 02, that was. Uh, but yeah, um, Mangus is a great film. I have to rewatch that. It's been a, it's been a minute. It's really great. It's, I've heard great things about it. I'm trying to get a copy right now because I have. A I have a DVD. Things. I'll burn it for you. I definitely have a. I have a DVD of it. You are my new best friend. All of a sudden, Tom. it's great. I'm looking. He forward was to brilliant. It. Gone too soon. Brilliant. Uh, I um. It's, and it's so one I mean, Leslie gone too soon. One of my good friends I've made through the radio show here is Del Shores, who of course produced and directed all the sort Brilliant. of lies. Leslie was a yes. huge part of. And of course, in the series, we have Rue McClanahan on, who you work with and loved Rue as well, right? Talk I about think... working with her. I remember you saying she was like one of your favorites back in the day. Oh, all, I mean, she's every. I mean, it's, it's Blanche. I mean. <laughs> It, it, it's wild to me. You know, I still fall asleep to Golden Girls every single night of my life, every night of my life when it's, you know, um, and it sometimes is funny, you know, and I sometimes it hits me, you know, I spent some time with that genius. Um, we were so young and we brought her to Provincetown to uh, do an evening with Rue McClanahan. And it was only a couple of years before she passed away. But I have to tell you, it was one of the greatest weekends of my life. We spent so much time together. We had so much fun. We um, picked her up in New York and drove her to P-Town. So we had these and back. And so we had these long car rides with her. You know, I wanted to be so grown up and fancy. I rented this super expensive Mercedes SUV so I could drive, you know, Blanche Devereaux in class. And um, we had done this show at, at Provincetown, you know, it's Provincetown, especially back then. It was all cash. So we had the best story where we were running out of gas and we got off in Bridgewater, Connecticut, which is not the finest place. We were below empty in a Mercedes with a golden girl and about 30 grand in cash in the car. And every person we would stop and ask for directions, they would say, oh, easy, a gas station, just go to the next light, take a right, then the next right takes your next right, then it'll be on the left. And we did that about 10 times and never a gas station. And we're just sitting there lost about to run out of gas, and I'll never forget in my life, we're just laughing, 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 and Rue McClanahan just goes, you think anyone in the world's having as much fun as us right now? And, uh, we, and no one was, and no one was. We had the best time. She would, she loved smoking, and she wasn't supposed to, and she'd go out to the pool in Provincetown and go, hey, boys, who wants to give Blanche Devereaux a cigarette? And, you know, they leaked. <laughs> I still have her lighter, because... I was instructed by her assistant anytime if I saw her with a cigarette, I was to take it and take the lighter. So I actually still, I have her lighter in a keepsake box. That's amazing. And I got to hold her Emmy. I got to hold her Emmy. That was one of the greatest speeches of all time. Up there too. Oh my God. Brilliant. Like, ah, yeah. yeah I, I love hearing stories. I, you got to share some with me off air because like I said, I know Dell has so many great ones from working on Sorted Lives. Oh, do you want to hear friends. Shady? Well, you want to hear, she, and she was great at throwing shade. So yeah. I brought her, she came, she went to see Naked Boy singing because, you know, I've been producing uh, Naked Boy singing for a thousand years and the boys were so excited, of course, and they had their moment with her backstage. That was their moment with Rue McClanahan. 
and uh, this twink snuck in. And, and I was like, you're not, you're taking time away from my boys. This is their time. And she was being so gracious saying, Tom's been raving about you and I see why, you know, making them feel like a million bucks because she was that kind of amazing. And this boy just pushes his way in, um, gets in front and just grabs her and goes, Rue, I've seen every episode of the Golden Girls. And we're all like, come on, kid. And she just looks at me like, oh, I got this. And then looks at him and says, do you think that makes you unique? Good for her. Oh, I read. love that. And there's, oh, you just got read by Rue. I love that. That's absolutely amazing. Very And of course, big gay musical, a lot of fun on screen. Yeah, oh, so fun. I mean, how do you kind of attach yourself to these projects? Do you have any kind of thing? Well, does something have to feel right? Then, you know, I mean, back or? then it was... A- yeah, well, you know, especially back then, especially like the independent things and you're all coming up. It's kind of who you're friends with and who can help each other out, right? Was That was the big thing, scraping money together for an independent film or someone has an idea. Um, and usually it would, if it was a film or TV or anything project, especially back then, it was born of the theater community usually. And it would be someone, you know, um, and uh, Rick Crome was in that movie and wrote the music for it. And Rick Crome wrote, wrote Musical. Yeah, I love the way that uh, I see a lot of your connections there. You work, you work with people a lot. I remember reading about you. You talk with Alex Ringler a lot. He's become a good friend of the show. Mm-hmm, yeah, he choreographed for you a lot. But yeah, you yeah, really do with that a million, We've done a million things together since Naked Boys '07 was the first thing we did. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. And then uh, we got to go into television a bit. Logo, you create a series. Morgan Fairchild. Yes. My, I love. my childhood so dream sweet. came true. I wrote a soap opera. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Talk about that. How much fun was um, that with you? That was uh, the most fun of my life. We've only done one episode. But, you know, I am hoping, uh, I, you know, it's a weird thing uh, with things you write and stuff. You sign on with someone if it doesn't work out. Um, and they own the rights for a long time. You are basically powerless to do anything with your own product for a while, which I understand because I'm on the other side of the table so much, but it's kind of been in limbo since the pandemic. And, um, it was a victim of the pandemic. Hope we were going to do several episodes with logo, but the pandemic, you know, did a lot worse than kill my soap opera. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do get the rights back in January. So I am actually very excited to explore that again but it's um it's an lgbtq plus soap opera and my vision was it would be just like you know everyone called a gay dynasty which is the best compliment ever but the most shrewd people that saw it when logo premiered it called it one life to live meets ugly betty and that's and i felt very much it was like that i loved that Uh, and morgan of course plays the villainess and i did write the role for her and i i it was i produced the um pilot independently on my own and it was a lot um, to do. It was, you know, 42 pages, a cast of 17 leads. Um, and we had some really great names in it. But I really wanted Morgan, but we did not have a great budget. And I remember her agent saying, you know, you seem really nice. I'm going to give it to her to read. But give it a few weeks. You know, she's. this is a lot for her to come out to New York for this amount of money. Three hours later, Morgan Fairchild herself called me and said, you wrote this for me, didn't you? Oh, and she said, my voice is in every line. I'm doing it. And it was, she was brilliant in it. And she was the greatest person in the world to work with. We did the pilot. Uh, it was like an eight hour day. It was 92 degrees. She was dressed in a mink coat, as you do. And, um, you know, for her costume. And, you know, when it came time for her to do her scene, of course, I had to write her a five page monologue to enter on. And, uh, you know, she comes into this fictional stone wall. And the story is um, the founder of this historic gay bar dies. And at his big memorial service, someone crashes it and announces that she's his wife. And she actually owns the bar and will be taking over the legacy. And I wrote the line because her name was Vivian King. So she says, you know, the queen is dead. Long live the king. Uh, About her gay ex-husband. And uh, but she was brilliant. And she did she did this five page monologue in one take, one take, one take and was laser focused and was genius. And it was a hundred degrees out. We're all dying. And I, and I said to her, Morgan, that was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my life. You were laser focused. How did you do it? And she said, Oh honey, in the seventies, I studied Kung Fu and I found my chi. 
which I think is the greatest thing anyone ever said to me. And you know, it was so cool. And I heard, I didn't really realize this until we dove in to the press with it. Uh, she is such an activist and she what she did for the the community especially in the 80s with the AIDS crisis um being one of the first A-list celebrities to speak out and you know she was blacklisted from television killed off a of falcon crest because she was so outspoken about AIDS she testified with Dr Fauci uh with Congress on behalf of it I mean she really was such an outspoken um supporter of the gay community during such a horrifying crisis when very few would speak out. And she really lost a lot because of it. And it's an amazing thing. And I really do hope we get to do this because she's brilliant and I think deserves that Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda renaissance, you know? I agree a hundred percent. That's another little connection we have because my buddy Stan Zimmerman, who wrote the first season of Golden Girls with Rue. And he also just wrote the Ladies of the 80s Christmas special. Amazing. I can't ladies. find it. I don't have television. It's not streaming. I don't know what to I do. I will get it for you. I'll, I'll, we'll trade. We'll do trades for it. Please, please. I look for it every day. Oh, it's, Nicolette it's Sheridan so good. was my fake crush before I, was, before I came out when I was seven. I used to pretend I was in love with Nicolette Sheridan. I love I that. I really yeah, like what a Jim wrote that uh, show before the pandemic, before the writer's strike happened. They had to squeeze it in and finish it like last second, like days before the writer's strike started. So yeah, uh, amazing, amazing show. Amazing. We'll, we'll trade. We'll trade some DVDs. I'm so excited. I like that. Very good. And then I want to talk for a second because you talk about your stellar cast. And of course, Morgan's amazing. I am very good social media friends with Omar Sharif Jr. Oh my so I God. I, you know, have you ever in your life met such a nicest, wonderful man nicest man in you know, the world i love him so much on social media but he's just we talk all the time and he's, he's just he's even he's even better in real life he is even mm. better in real life omar sharif jr is one of my favorite humans on the planet earth i love him with all my heart he's my brother i love that that's amazing and he's so I, handsome and so talented and oh he's just goodness. all the boxes checked he's the best yeah, exactly and then I got to ask you, because you you work with Alex Newell in this as well. And yes, I remember I, I just saw one him of Sunday. previous interviews. I saw them Sunday. Exactly. And you wanted to bring back Once on, Once on an Island. I remember you read, like in 2011, you were thinking you had your dream cast and everything. And then all of a sudden, it's revived with Alex wow, Newell. That's, wow. You know, thank you for saying that, because I, you know, I, I, I've said when I saw it at Circle of the Square, you know, I talked about this. You did. You did. I, I like, I love to do research. And I, so I'm reading your interviews from 2011, 2009. Or yeah, it was. I did. But nine. I'm so happy it did happen. And, and they were really. Now, I'm so thrilled Alex has a Tony now. But let's be honest. They, they deserved a nom for uh, Once in this Island. Yes. Agreed. But 100%. It was, they were brilliant. Brilliant. Love it. That's that's one of my dream guests I'm going to have on. I've, I'm, I've become friends with Jenna Ushkowitz and Kevin McHale. Um, Kevin's Kevin, on my show actually yeah, Friday. Jenna, of course, you know, Jenna's huge Broadway, of course. So, But uh, I'm trying to get Alex through them. I hate asking people to introduce me to people because that's just so rude. But it's like I really want to talk to Alex because he is. Yeah. Oh, it's a thrill. Oh, what a, what a talent. I have my best idea ever for Alex and um ever I've never had such a good idea in my life but it's it's network tv like it's huge I am excited for that because I was such a fan of the um what's the musical the Jane Zoe. yeah Zoe's oh she's so good on that so good on that I mean you got it all even Bernadette Peters drops in amazing one more do you need amazing. I mean and, and Lorelai Gilmore is just there I mean how perfect Exactly. Oh, and then we got to talk about After Forever. I'm a Kevin Spiritus fan, huge fan. Oh, of Kevin I, did, I just saw Kevin uh, um, at our at the at our Alexandra Billings uh, little workshop last week. Um, Kevin actually came. You are my spirit animal. We're going to talk about because we're going to talk about Amanda later on because I kind of I, it was like one of the greatest thrills of my life. I do a little Monday news segment on my shows. And so I, when it was announced that she was going to go to Broadway for it, I didn't even realize you were attached. I did an announcement for it on my thing, and she Thank gave me a nice social media plug back, and it was so. Yeah, we're developing it. We're, I mean, we are in early developments, but it's beautiful. Even 
you know, doing the research. But the story is amazing, right? Oh my God, her story, everything she's been books. through. I yeah. love it. Oh, and she's a genius. She's also oh. one of the greatest performers ever. Big time. You know, um, but there's some beautiful stuff. But um, yeah, Kevin came and supported. And it was lovely to see Kevin. I love that. And then before we go to your theater work, we've got to talk about your philanthropy. I mean, it's amazing what you and your husband, Michael, have done. Um, I've had, I've seen so many great things. So many of my friends have played Birdland. That was one that really resonated with me, of course, Stonewall back in the day. Talk about uh, these projects. I mean, you're just all about making sure that these things are preserved. Yeah. That's kind of important to you. You know, I don't know. It just really just seemed like a no brainer at the time. We, I mean, we're all very capable of things and we had nothing to do during the pandemic. And someone told me it started with the West Bank, the legendary West Bank Cafe, Laurie Beachman Theater, which is my favorite place in New York. It's 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 my place. I, I, I mm -hmm. ate there four times last week alone, you know, um, and I was told because of the pandemic, they were going to close their doors in 20 days. And we said, over our dead bodies. So we, um, this was a 12 days before Christmas, so the 12 days of Christmas kind of, and we decided we were going to put together an all day Christmas telethon in the, within, you know, less than two weeks. And we were gonna raise the money to save it. And everyone, everyone jumped on. It was the most inspiring thing ever. It was, it mirrored It's a Wonderful Life where, oh, Steve Olson and the West Bank Cafe are in trouble. I'm in, I mean, you know, Deborah Messing did it, Sean Penn did it. 500 other brilliant people did it. And we did a 10 hour telethon uh, and raised the money to save it. And then the very next day, Johnny Valenti and Jim Caruso called me and said, you know, Birdland's in the same situation. Do you think you could do it again? And I said, let's do it, but can I have more than 12 days? So we got a, <laughs> we got a full month to do that one. And again, it was the same exact thing where I, people were just looking for a way to help. Everyone wanted to help. They just, they just needed a way to help. And um, that Bill Clinton opened that one. President Clinton uh, opened it, telling the history of Birdland and Charlie Parker. And it was so, you know, just doing his Bill Clinton thing. And uh, so, and then Whoopi Goldberg closed it and every star in between. It was so exquisite and again, hit the mark and saved Birdland. Then the York Theater had just had a flood. So on top of the pandemic, their theater was destroyed. And how were they going to stay, no pun intended, afloat? So we uh, did um, we did a, re a virtual remount of their biggest hit, The Musical, The Musical, The Musical. And instead of a four-person cast, we broke it down so it was a 26-person cast. And that's actually how I met Alexandra Billings. There was a role we knew uh, she had to play. And I just put on Facebook, this is ridiculous that I don't know Alexandra Billings. Someone connect me with her right now. You know, and uh, Hillary Clinton closed that one, and Audra did it, Patti Lapone did it, Bernadette Peters did it, Joel Gray, uh, the brilliant Andre DeShields was genius. I mean, everyone did it. It was, um, and again, we did it. And then uh, we did the Stonewall one to raise money for their incredible uh, Safe Spaces charity, Sigby, and um, Nancy Pelosi opened that one. So it was wild. And you know, and what an amazing way to spend a dark time, you know, to rediscover how the great humanity can be and to see people being the very best that they can be. And it was it was amazing. It was the most incredible six months of my life. Um, we raised over a million dollars, helped so many people and just had the best time doing it and made lifelong friends. Um, you know, I'm friends with Andre DeShields. I used to see him. We live across the street from each other. I used to see Andre DeShields at the Food Emporium and get so nervous that I would go and hide. I'd go, oh, my God, it's the Wiz. And I remember one time I hid down and it held Wonder Bread over my face because I was so nervous. I was just staring at him, you know, and now he's a dear friend. I love uh, it. It's well, crazy. You were one of the OG. I mean, that's a, at least that stuff happened during the pandemic. I think you were one of the early ones. I mean. Eric Bergen's gone on to create a whole bunch of great ones. My friends uh, Justin and Emerson out in L.A. did one for the whole <laughs> drag controversy going on. So, But you were one of the first that just uh, saw what the potential was because you did some amazing work in those. So. And yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was wild and wonderful and a whirlwind. And I just, it, it blows my mind. It feels like a dream sometimes, like, you know.
Well, good on you and your husband for making those things happen. I mean, that's that's fantastic. It's that's honor of my life. I love that. Well, let's kind of gear our way into theater now. Let's start with you a bit. I mean, you were an actor before you were this mega producer, director thing. I love myself a good diva. Talk about your diva shows. Those seem like they were like <laughs> divas I've done. Hit, right? You know, um, so we we always say uh, I'm a professional fan. That's the thing. You know, um, it's I, I have a very hard time mustering up my magic unless I genuinely love something. You know. I worship Barry Manilow. Um, you know, like I'm a jet. I have to be a real fan of something and really believe in something to get behind it with, you know, the vigor I do. So, um, and that's always been like that. So, I used to tell these stories about how I'd, you know, go see Aida and I saw the standby go on who replaced Heather Headley, Maya Days, and became obsessed with her. And then I went thirty times in a row and, um, you know, stalked her into friendship and. Uh, <laughs> Ellen Green was one of my childhood obsessions and I couldn't believe she didn't have an album. And I stalked her and said, and the first thing I ever produced was her album. I scraped the money together when I was 23 to do her album. So we did a show basically kind of making fun of me called Divas I've Done, which is basically how obsessed I was with people. There was a Rue McClanahan, Golden Girls thing, Jane Wyman. I was always obsessed with Jane Wyman and Falcon Crest. And, um, and it was, yeah, and it was, and it was only supposed to be for two nights at Don't Tell Mama. It was kind of for fun. And it got rave reviews, and I did it for two years. And I did it all over the country, and it kind of is where we learned how to produce. It was the first thing we ever produced because it was self-produced, and it was it was genuinely a mega hit. I still think I made more money off of that show than anything I've ever done in my life. Wow. Um, yeah, and then it was like how hard it is to act and produce. I can see why you went to the producing yes, side. Yes, no, it was one or the other, and I said, well, I, you know, at least this when the show goes up, I can be in the back of the room with a drink in my hand. There you go. And then afterwards, so um, it was yeah, it was perfect. It felt like I came, I did what I came to New York to do, and I could move on. So I retired at the at the old age of twenty five from performing. <laughs> there you go, but from from in front of the camera to behind, as they say. Yeah, I called it my Jerry, my Jerry Seinfeld. I I said I was gonna, re I was leaving on top. I was gonna, no way I was gonna ever recreate that magic. So I'm out. I love that center stage to waiting in the wings, making it all happen. Yeah, Very I wrote a parody of Summer That's Green about gay marriage called Summer That's Pink, and that like was the big thing that made it really take off. And I thought, well, that's a moment. Never gonna, never gonna recreate that moment. <laughs> I love that. Oh my goodness. Well, and then you've done started producing these great things. We talked. About, you talked about naked men, sing, naked boys singing. My friend David Hernandez has been in that recently, I, both in New York me, and Vegas. Mine. Yeah, I mine, know. Mine, I cast him. Yeah. I, I, he was so excited to come to New York because, I mean, yeah. yeah. Vegas well, was he did Vegas off. as well, and that was a big that was a big production. Vegas was a, a big deal. Yeah, Matthew Ladinsky, good friend and everything. So, yeah, you, you had a great cast there. Yeah, well, Matthew Vegas. was first in it in 09 for me. Oh, I didn't know he did it before that. Yeah. I had never been talking Province about Town, it before. He, Yep, Matthew has done Provincetown, Palm Springs, and Vegas. I did not know that for Adam. I just mm -hmm. knew about Vegas. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, Matthew's one of my best friends in the world. He's a great guy. I've had him on the show a few times. Him and Kevin are both just I, like... They so met because of... Uh, Kevin and him met because of me. No. Yes. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. Look at you, Mr. Matchmaker. On I'm a matchmaker. And I gave I... Star Manning from One Life to Live her boy boyfriend, and they're about to have a baby. So just call you me are, Dolly Levi. I'm liking this. This should be so my side cool. hustle. I'm learning all this stuff I didn't even know. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, talk about musical a bit. That's that's fun. Mm. I saw. I've seen that a couple times, and I love that it stays fresh and that it's fun. And yeah, brings up Vegas as well. Well, yeah, musical was my baby. Musical was kind of the big, has been the through line of my career. You know, it's the third longest running musical review in history now. We did it for so long. Started in 09 and has uh, done it as recently as this summer. Um, you know, uh, it's just been so much fun. It, it, it's crazy we ran so long and only a handful of people have been in it because we have such a ball. Everyone just stayed for, even Christine Petty stayed in it for eight years, you know. <laughs> Um, and actually Kristen Alderson, star manning from One Life to Live, did uh, both Vegas productions and the recent, the recent New York production. You know, she does brilliant impressions. No. Oh, that no. girl can do anything. 
She I didn't know. She's I also in Milan. I didn't know she could do impressions. Of course, I know oh, she. Well, is. Emmy Award-winning talent, right there. Oh my God, that's so amazing. Yes, and I know. Musicals the most fun of it. We just, I can't tell you how much fun we had over the years. Um, for and you know, and then there was that time where I was having the celebrity guests in, and it was constantly every month a new wild. You know, all of a sudden you're just hanging out with Latoya Jackson every day. Um, we got to spend eight weeks with Sherry O'Terry, the most fun, fabulous, coolest gal in the world. You know, um, Andrea McCardle did the show, you know, and you put things together and all of a sudden Annie singing your music. It's the it's a, unbelievable. Um, you know, uh, Carson Kressley, who I'm sure, you know, he did the show and it was fabulous. And then Candy Burris from Real Housewives of Atlanta did it. And uh, Michael and I actually were invited to her wedding and got to go to her wedding and be part of the wedding special on Bravo. So, yeah, I mean, musical was absolutely one of the most life changing, amazing experiences of my life. And I I, I can't wait for the next incarnation of it because musicals kind of like that, you know, uh, horror movie villain. It just always comes back from the dead when you don't expect it, it to. It just rises. There's always something to talk about in theater, right? You can always yeah. find a new story to tell. Yeah, yeah. I always say, oh, no, I think we're done with that. And then my phone rings and I'm like, sure, let's do it. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's get into current day. I mean, we'll start, of course, with Harmony. You told about being such a fan of Barry's. When did you first meet Barry? And talk about that first experience when you're peers. That's got to be frightening and exciting all at once. Oh, no, honey. Barry Manilow is peerless. Mm. Peerless. I'll talk about for you, though. Oh, my goodness. No, yes. No, for me, I still am just in awe. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, he's, his brilliance knows no peers. But uh, I first met him, actually, in Las Vegas. <laughs> I was front row being a big gay fool, jumping up and down and screaming. And security came over at the end of Copacabana and said, could you please wait here after the show? And I said, oh, why? What did I do? Oh, no, Mr. Manilow would like to meet you. So I was actually, yes. Uh, and that's how I first met him. Um, from You know, again, I'm a professional fan. I stock them all in, you know, they can't help it. I just keep showing up until they have to hang out with me and work with me. But, um, yeah, and then um, I met um, Bruce Sussman, the brilliant lyricist who's written so many of uh, Barry's great lyrics, and uh, his amazing partner, Rob, who has the brilliant uh, Naughty But Nice Rob um, blog, right, and at the at backstage at Randy Rainbow, who's one of my dearest and oldest friends. And I was, and they said, how come you're not involved in Harmony? And I said, I don't know. I mean, I, and they said, you have to be. You have to be involved in Harmony. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, sure. And uh, it was a little bit before the Off-Broadway production. And so I jumped right in um, and fell madly in love with it downtown. And just said, I'll raise whatever it takes. I'll do anything um, to be a part of this. It's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. Um, I think I've seen it 30 something times and sob every single time. <laughs> uh, the performances are some of the best you will ever see. Barry wrote the most exquisite score with uh, some songs that will be around forever. New classics. Bruce Usman has written a beautiful book and tells such an important story of, you know, the six most famous people ever that you don't know about. And the story of Harmony is the reason. And it's brilliant. The amazing Julie Banco is in it, who is about to be our biggest star on Broadway. You know, as it's amazing to watch her star rise. And then Chip Zion, who is one of our greatest stars and has been for so long. This is really his his big, big role. Like, this is his role. And he has an 11 o'clock number that you know, we'll go down with Rose's turn and Lot's wife from Carolina change and some of, and he just delivers it. Like you've never seen anything delivered like a true legend center stage. And the six boys who play the harmonists are brilliant. They are, their voices are just seamless. And Danny Kornfeld, who plays the young version of Chip Zion is just such a star in the making. And he has this beautiful love song called every single day that Barry and Bruce of course wrote that is the most breathtaking um, love song I think that's been on Broadway in forever. It's magical. I could I could go see that show every night of my life. I forget I'm involved in it because when I'm there, 
I am a fan again. I feel like a Broadway kid at that show. I get excited like I did when I used to, you know, see Hairspray 15 times or, you know. I love that. So amazing. I can't wait to see it when I come out there early in the year. Uh, just it's just a little clip we played in the beginning here. I mean, just the voices, the way the voices meld. They're amazing. Ah. I, I, I'm, oh, I'm so looking forward to it. No, you're, it's it's why it's just so good. It's it's I've ne you know it's I, I very rarely have ever experienced anything like it, and it's happened every single time. Where especially in the last twenty minutes of the show, which is is a lot. It's it's very very deep, and you know, um, you it, there's a communal experience happening in the theater. The entire theater breathes as one, and you it's it's there. Ha it, you can just feel every single person having an identical. Ex identical experience it's it's a wild thing it really is talk yeah, about Barry's experience with it i mean i mean he's had amazing career of course already yeah. but i could just imagine the first time he's out there watching this happen it's got to be an amazing moment for him well you know this was a long time coming he and bruce have been trying to get this to broadway for 30 years yeah you know? and it's, there's yes and there's been uh several uh, several productions of it over the years, all well received and critically acclaimed, and you know looked like it was going to be the one, but something stopped it. And um, you know, I think it's because this was this was the moment for it. This was the moment, and um, you know, talk about things being worth waiting for. And so that that has been an amazing thing just to have a front row seat for, to um, to see Barry and Bruce finally achieve you know, this dream after so long and for it to be so beautiful and such an exquisite version of this beautiful show that they've spent so much time and put so much effort, love and care into. And it's it's just wonderful. Um, and, you know, bravo to Ken Davenport, lead producer, for making it happen because he, he did. He, he got it in. Congratulations to and you. Yeah, and and the addition the of Warren Carlyle as director certainly went a long way. Right. He's course. brilliant. He's brilliant. Mm. I mean, we're talking talk about great female directors. I mean, we'll go into How to Dance in Ohio. There's an amazing glut of great female directors all of a sudden. I mean, I don't yes, know if I just about time. Before, or if it's just finally happening. But Well, they've no, they've always been brilliant. They just haven't been allowed to do their work. There's I mean, come on. This is this is this is it's ridiculous. It's taken this long, but thank goodness it's starting to happen. But you know, lots more work to be done. I love hearing that. Sammy's amazing. I saw a lot of the clips of opening night. We're talking about now how to dance in Ohio. Um, it, tell everyone if they don't know about the story because it did just started premiering. Give everyone a little bit of the story about what it's about, and then talk about this premiere you had. Some of the people that your characters or cast is based on come out for the yeah. for the call. Oh my gosh! And also, did you see who I spent all of opening night with? Did you see Forever oh, My Girl? I love it. I me love and Paula. It. Me and Paula Abdul. Oh, all night. And Paula. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I know what a gay boy's dream—a Broadway opening and spending the night with Paula Abdul. <laughs> okay. But okay, so How to Dance in Ohio, which just opened on Broadway Sunday. <laughs> um, is um, a new Broadway musical which is based on the PBD award winning HBO documentary of the same name it follows um, several young adults um, as they learn be um, behavioral skills as they're gearing up for their first ever formal dance and a brilliant kind wonderful uh, man named uh, Dr. Amigo uh, is the person who had this incredible center and um i've gotten to meet him a few times and he's just lovely and he he really what he's done is so beautiful and uh the musical is based on that and you know it takes liberties of course dramatic liberties and but it it is the most charming story ever we follow these uh seven kids seven young adults as they prepare for this this spring formal and we we see you know the ups and downs of their lives, the challenges and achievements of their lives, and the milestones they're making. And it all in all just is the most charming, heartfelt, heartfelt, beautiful evening in the theater. Um, it's just goosebumps 
thinking about it. And it's the first time in history that, you know, the seven autistic characters are played by seven autistic actors and they are all seven stars. They are superstars. And just watching that inclusion and, and you know, the proof is in the pudding. There's no reason not to, to, to cast like this and let people tell their own stories because it is such a breathtaking result. And, you know, um, Liam Pierce, who plays the role of Drew, has the big, big uh, 11 o'clock number in Act 2 called Building Momentum. It's a bop. Our composer, Jacob, is a genius and wrote a bop, as the kids say. Uh, and it got a standing ovation on opening night. Imagine that. I mean, it was so, I mean, it was, what a moment. It was electrifying. And, but a standing ovation in the middle of a show. People, some people go their whole lives without that. It's a dream. And, you know, just to watch everyone's dreams come true, again, from the, I get, I get a front row seat to it and it's an honor. Um, it's really wild, uh, this show. It, it's so exciting that it exists. And um, it, it's crazy how beautiful it is. You're just so, it's like watching it is like getting a big hug. It feels, I mean, you had to see Paula sobbing. She made the most beautiful Instagram video afterwards because she couldn't stop crying. Um, and she's a professional judge, so she knows. She knows. Paula knows. She's a, she judges professionally. So you have to listen to Paula Abdul. But, um, yeah, and it's, it really is. And the team involved is great. Uh, the lead producers are, are are just so caring. And so many uh, so many things have, have changed in the, in the approach of theater and, um, and include in inclusion and it, it's, I can't again this is another thing I can't believe I'm involved at all and that my name is in the playbill um and, re, and, and they gave me really nice billing so it, it blows my mind it's great it, it's so good and so lovely I don't even know how to articulate it because it's it's just such a special moment in the theater you know I get so overwhelmed when I think about this show well, you all deserve the accolades. I just heard some amazing. I saw a couple. Of, I know a couple of went to previews and just, oh my goodness, it's just amazing work in both those. And a little behind the scenes, of course, we're time hopping. We're filming this in mid December. It's coming out very early January. Oh, yes. So uh, it's been out a month now. And of course, uh, Harmony's been out two months now. But let's talk about stuff. I mean, this is just coming up and this is an amazing yeah. story. Talk about that a little bit. Well, um, Suffs is uh, Suffs started off Broadway at the Public Theater uh, the same season Harmony was off Broadway, and I was not involved in the off Broadway production. I was very I was doing musical in Las Vegas, and I was really focused on on Harmony and um, and but I was very excited about it. It's a it's a, a musical about the suffragist movement, and so I mean so up my alley, everything <laughs> I love, and it's it's beautiful, and the score is. So stunning, and it's an all female cast again, so up my alley. And um, then a little birdie told me, um, so you know, it's coming to Broadway, and Hillary Clinton um, is going to be a co producer on it. So you should probably be a co producer on it. And I was, yes, P uh, you, of course, of course. Um, so I, again, you know, this season is insane um, for me. It's 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 a dream come true that you know I begin with Harmony, the Barry Manilow musical, uh, and am ending with a show about the suffragette movement, co-produced by Hillary Rodham Clinton, my my lifelong hero, the my number one. You are the Hillary OG. I've been yeah, no, a number fan. forever. Um, I my I still have my huge Hillary sticker on my little mini fridge. I brought it to Democratic headquarters. We were doing phone banking, and I had phone banking in my house for her. And uh, just the Clintons are amazing. I mean, we could talk about them for another hour and so. Oh, I know. It's got to be exciting to just continue that relate. You've had a relationship for a long time, but just to get back into the, mix those worlds of the, the theater, it had to be kind of exciting. Oh, it's crazy. Um, it's wild. She's so gracious and wonderful. I saw her at an event. She interviewed Patti LuPone for her podcast, and I was front row. Wow. Um, wow. And I, I saw her backstage before, and I said, I, and I said I'm, do, I am, I'm, I'm going to do stuff with you. And she was like, oh, my goodness. And I said, imagine if we win a Tony together. And she said, well, now I'd love that. <laughs> <So> imagine <laughs> that was 
<laughs> you <laughs> are my hero, my friend. I love all this so much. No, it's crazy. Well, the Tony certificate for producers has everyone's name on it. And, on you know, awards don't matter. However, if Suff is nominated, don't think it has not been in my little head. Oh, I'm going to have a Tony certificate that has my name somewhere and Hillary's name somewhere. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> crazy. I love it. I love it. That's amazing. What's going on? But I'm so excited about it. Oh, you should be. You should be. Every bit of it. Let's wrap up with some kind of generic questions sure. that I just like your take on. I mean, you're a huge advocate for LGBTQ rights. Peter have always been really strong in that. But talk about mixing LGBTQ activism with theater, with film, with television, the importance of it is do you feel like it's getting better? Because I mean, we've had three steps forward with marriage equality, and then we've had five steps back since Trump and everything. How do you feel the marriage is going right now? Where are we at? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Hopefully, uh, you know, what our wonderful President Joe Biden did uh, last year to codify helps a lot and goes a long way. Um, it's nice to know at least we have an administration that's on our side right now. Um, and we need to keep it that way, period. Period. There is no if, ands, or buts. There's no other way. Um, but um, as far as art goes, you know, I think we are seeing a lot more representation uh, for the LGB, uh, LGB community or Q. So I think we see, we're seeing so much, you know, uh, fellow travelers. Oh my God, heartbreaker. Don't you just die? Doesn't it just make you cry? You can't watch it not cry. If you can't, can't watch it not cry and just be like, how is that? I can't believe this is happening. But, you know, um, what, and what I'm very excited about my upcoming project um, with Alexandra Billings is more trans representation. Um, but, you know, we have a song in the, Ale in the Alexandra Billings show um, called Leading Lady. And it's time. It's time. Front and center. Lead roles. Um, more lead roles, no more supporting roles, no more throwing bones to any member of the community. Representation matters all around. It's right. a, our, you know, so if we're going to support our community, we're, we need to support, uh, trans actors and actresses as much as we support anyone else. And, you know, I think us as gay men are doing great with representation. We're doing a thousand, thousand times it's better. And it, yeah, and, and it's thrilling to see we're not just Jack anymore. Um, you know, I can, uh, I don't go, I don't have ninety people a day tell me, you know, who you remind me of, because <laughs> right. oh, there was one of us, right? Um, you know, uh, oh yeah, I'm Paul Lind. That's what I got. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I think we've come such a long way, but um, you know, I have a fifteen year old trans nephew, Parker, and I I want him to be able to turn on the TV and see himself represented. I want him to go to the theater and see himself repre represented. I don't want him to think he's ever an afterthought, a secondary. Um, we all deserve, every single person, especially children, deserve the right to dream because nothing is more powerful than your dreams and your manifestation and believe and believing you can be something. Um, and we need to make sure that everyone has that opportunity to see themselves represented. It, well, to me, it's life changing. You know, I, I don't know what I would have been if I wasn't, I, you know, if I wasn't allowed to dream big. And I think, and that's what I'm really excited about with um, the Alexandra Billings show is, She's so exquisite. She's such a star. Uh, the show is already so beautiful. And you are going to see one of our greatest stars in theater, TV, and film, Alexander Billings, front and center, being the leading lady. She'd be a brilliant mame. It should, that should be a conversation. It, you know, it shouldn't just be that she's a Vera, a Vera because she's a trans actress. Uh, it was great that she was metamorable and wicked, but she should... It the conversation should be there, um, you know, you know, and I, so I do hope I hope this show goes a ways in doing that, because sometimes, you know, people aren't the most creative always all around. Sometimes you have to show them that it works. And then when everyone sees it works, they go, oh, that's a good idea. And they jump on, you know, so sometimes we just have to kick the door open and say, let's do the work. So well, hopefully, you know, all of this goes a little ways in helping. 
Well said. I'm going to have to bug you to get her on when she when the show starts to premiere. Yeah. I, I, was, I told you off air, I've been a huge fan of Alexander yes. for such a long time. Uh, great story, uh, great representation. So, yeah, definitely need to that, make that happen. Now, you talk about you being, you wanted to be involved with something because you're such a fan, and you've become now um, a hero to so many people in theater with the different projects you've attached to. Who are some of the people you feel have kind of mentored you throughout your career that have really helped take you to the next level? Oh, you know, I have, when I was very young, there are two people that really helped me. My first voice teacher, Teddy Marsh, um, kind of, you know, was the one that said, no, you're a star. You belong, like you belong in New York. You, we need to do, you know, we need to get you out of here. Uh, and, uh, Teddy was this brilliant singer who moved to Cape Cod and kind of gave it all up to raise her fabulous daughter, Isabeau. And, uh, what's actually very exciting is, um, you know, she has stayed like my second mother and everything my whole life was very responsible to pushing me to the next level of my career. And uh, her and Isabeau, who's like a sister to me, are actually also producers on How to Dance in Ohio. They came on board to all do this dream together and it was their Broadway debut. So th that was a very exciting thing. And um, very young when I was doing Summer Stock, uh, a fabulous actor named Gil Fisher, a big leading man gay actor, you know, <laughs> like the brilliant Tevya and Zorba type, uh, was the intern director. And I, I was an intern at a summer stock called the Weathervane Theater in New Hampshire. And he took me under his wing and, you know, really believed in me. And um, then, and you know, in his later life, ended up he ended up our house manager at Musical for many, many, many years. And he passed away last January. Uh, in his 90s, and he was a rock star till the end. So, I mean, they were very, very, very much um, in my world. Uh, Robin Strasser has been an idol forever, and she's become a dear friend. I was actually her date for the One Life to Live reboot premiere. And, you know, um, and I, I do I do look up to people. Hillary Clinton is probably the person that has influenced me the most in making the hard choices to do the most good and do the right thing and to reevaluate my goals. You know, I wanted to be a rich, powerful soap villain, basically. Mm -hmm. I moved to New York wanting to be Dorian Lord or Alexis Colby. And uh, because of Hillary, I said, well, you know, maybe money and power isn't the most important thing. You know, maybe I should use, you know, my gifts to try to do all the good I can. And, you know, the old saying, try to plant the seeds for trees you'll never enjoy the shade of. And uh, it's a lot harder. It really is. And it's, so, but it's, it's the right thing to do. And it's been great. And it's, um, so I think, I think Hillary is basically probably the person who's changed my life more than anyone. It's just by leading, leading by example. She leads by such a gracious, strong example. And, you know, I hear her voice in my head every day, take criticism seriously, but not personally. And like, and all the other amazing Hillaryisms that get us through day to day. And after what she went through in 2016 and what we all went through, I am afraid of nothing. There is no disappointment that I'm afraid of now. I am ready to roll up my sleeves and go to work for anything. Cause you know, we've survived a lot and we, we can continue to do so and continue to do the right thing. I think. Very well said. And thank you for all your activism and for everything you do. Let's finish off with a couple words of advice for anyone coming into, I mean, theaters changed the entire entertainment industry has changed so much. What's, what's your words of wisdom for up and comers today that either want to work um, on stage, behind stage and everything. What, what's your advice these days? On stage, be yourself period. Don't listen to anyone that tells you not to be yourself. There is this terrible trend that has gone on for decades and decades and decades of trying to create cookie cutters. Don't do it. Whatever makes you you is your magic. Your magic is you. That is the only thing you have in the world is your individuality. And you know what? I can tell you from personal experience, being your own self might lose you 99 out of 100 jobs, but it's the only way you'll get that one job that'll change your life. That's my biggest advice. Just be true to yourself and don't listen to anyone who tells you not to be yourself. Behind the scenes, work hard and don't give up. You're going to get knocked down. And this goes for any walk of life, but you're going to get knocked down over and over and over again. Get right back up. Keep working. Keep dreaming. Manifest it. And you never know. My dad always says life flips on a dime. You're one drop of good news away from a new lease on life. So 
at the very worst moment of your life, you have no idea what's happening tomorrow. Just keep going forward, get up and keep believing in your dreams. They'll happen. They happen. I'm proof. I'm not supposed to exist. None of this was supposed to happen. And I get to live my dreams every day. Well, we are lucky you do exist, my friend. Tom Dangora, amazing conversation with you today. Thanks so much for sharing your your great words, your wisdom, mm -hmm. and some amazing theater, and as well as films and television. Let everyone know your fantastic Instagram account, because you have some great behind the scenes, just some fun. Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, thank at Tom Dangora. Please follow me. It's fun. I'm not, I, I am, I show my age a little um, with it. I, you know, I don't understand you know how some people just you look in their profile and it's six photos of landscapes. No, you're going to see a lot of my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> like um, you, but Sunday you would have seen like 400 photos of Paula Abdul. That's awesome. Oh, the, okay. Yes. Lots of Hillary Clinton and lots of Yorkies on my, on my social, but lots of other stuff too. And the best place to find information about all these amazing theater you have going on here. I mean, you sold tickets at tickets and posters way back in the day. And I now did. you're telling people how to find these things. How, yeah. how, what do you recommend? Well, you can, you can find, find all, of my, all of my projects you can find at TomDangora.com. But if you want tickets for Harmony, um, please go to Harmony. And, oh, my gosh. Ready? I'm going to look it up. Just so I get it right, it's HarmonyAnewMusical.com. I was going to say Harmony the New Musical, so HarmonyAnewMusical.com. Okay. Amazing. All righty. Well, Tom Diagor, stay on the line for me. Fantastic chat. Guys, be sure to look for us Tuesday. We're going to have a special five questions with Tom. you got to get, if you're a theater guy like I am, you know I love the theater. Get yourself out to New York. Get yourself to regional. Get yourself to local touring companies. You'll enjoy every single one, I promise you. We appreciate you tuning in to Left of Straight Show. We'll be here every Thursday and Friday with brand new interviews. Have a great day, everyone. Bye bye. All right, that was great. Thanks for listening to the Left of Straight Show. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distributor and please give us a five star rating so more listeners can find us. You can follow us on social media and be sure to check out our website, www.leftofstraightradio.com for contests and other news and information. See you next week.